Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another multi-level Monday. Today, we're going to be talking about Beauty Counter. I've been meaning to cover them for a while, as I mentioned on the EcoWell podcast a couple months ago, which by the way, that was an amazing podcast. Now, Beauty Counter has this reputation of being a clean, safe, transparent, accountable brand, all the buzzwords that would make any consumer impressed, especially if they're trying to be a bit more aware of who it is they're buying from. However, is that reputation actually deserved or just really clever marketing? If you're familiar with MLMs or multi-level marketing companies, I'm sure you probably already know the answer, but let's dive right in and take a look at it all the same and find out what this MLM is really about. Now, while some sources say Beauty Counter was founded in 2013, others say it was founded in 2011. Either way, Greg Renfrew's story is essentially the same. According to a New York Times article, in 2006, Greg watched An Inconvenient Truth, the Al Gore documentary on climate change. Greg stated, I was washing my children with a natural foaming oatmeal body wash by a name brand. But when I went on the Environmental Working Group's database, it rated it an eight out of nine for toxicity. I thought I was using natural oatmeal body wash. And in fact, I was putting toxins on my babies. I was just outraged. And I became truly obsessed with this. At the same time, I was looking at where direct to consumer was going and where I saw the biggest white space was in beauty no one had pioneered meaningful change in that industry. It took me a couple of years to concept the idea, the selling model, create the products from scratch. I went in thinking that we could just use white label products and change a few ingredients. That was certainly not the case. A few years later, when she started Beauty Counter, she made a list of more than 1500 potentially harmful ingredients she vowed to never use. She chose the MLM business model and chose to create regulation in her own products because according to Greg, the FDA does a poor job of protecting consumers in personal care products. And Greg isn't completely wrong in that statement. Whether it's other MLMs, Morphe, or the knockoff industry, any of those previous episodes, I would make it clear that the cosmetics industry in particular is, as she puts it, woefully underregulated. And that's true. I don't disagree with Greg's never list in that context anyway. There are absolutely certain ingredients out there that I won't use when I'm working on making my own soaps or candles. For example, there's certain micas and oils that just aren't sustainable to use and take advantage of child labor and a whole host of other issues. However, Greg loses so, so much credibility when she chooses an MLM business model for her business. According to her, We are creating economic opportunity for women where they have the opportunity to sell a product that they believe in and get paid on the sale of that product. We pay our consultants on the sale of products and they are also able to build a team to monetize other people's time, but they only get paid a very small amount on their team. And Greg isn't a fool. She's worked for some incredibly well-known higher ups out there, such as Martha Stewart and Susie Hilfiger. She isn't someone that was perhaps manipulated into an MLM when they were younger, grew up thinking it was a good business model and then started one of their own in the later years. She specifically sought out and chose this MLM model because of her own misguided belief that she was creating an economic opportunity for women. Right. In a video interview with Entrepreneur, she words this differently though, and says that the reason she now has over 40,000 distributors and counting is because she believes that's how you start a movement, through people. Whether it's bloggers, friends, or influencers, Greg says that people are listening to each other rather than stores. And I don't disagree with that sentiment either. I'm more likely to buy something that's suggested to me from someone I trust and whose opinion I value. It's not all that odd that Greg uses different answers between these two interviews. They can both be true. But the reason I want to emphasize this point is to make it abundantly clear that Greg chose this business model. Even with all the evidence out there that MLMs failed the distributors, she picked it. Personally, that makes me question her business integrity. But that is of course my opinion. Let's continue. 
Not only does Beauty Counter claim to grant financial freedom, but their distributors make remarks about how this is a replacement for a corporate income or how they can retire from their career to be at Beauty Counter. And for me, that instantly shoots up every red flag. Now, as a side note, I do think it's really disgusting that distributors are seemingly encouraged to hate on people with nine to five jobs. I don't think the problem is any one seller, but in general, the MLM culture and language that these higher ups tend to use. There is nothing wrong with having a nine to five. There's nothing wrong with working for a corporation and there's nothing wrong with wanting that stability to put food on the table for yourself or for your family. And if you hate that kind of lifestyle, yeah, it can absolutely be draining, but gig work absolutely has its own downsides too. Now, we will revisit that a little bit later on when we took a look at their income disclosures, but for now, I'm already incredibly skeptical of Greg's true intent here. There may be some success stories at Beauty Counter, yes, but for Greg to say that she started this business to provide an opportunity for women feels misleading. For now though, let's get into the next aspect of Beauty Counter, the products themselves. Beauty Counter means clean, at least according to their website. As it turns out, clean isn't cheap. Their foaming cleanser is $32 alone, and it's not exactly a large container either. Normally, this would be where I compare their prices to other brands out there, but I won't compare Beauty Counter to a random brand that you can just find at Target since they claim to be different. Instead, let's take a look at their ingredients and see if we can't find something similar. Their ingredient list consists of, well, a lot of chemicals that I can't pronounce, quite frankly. Just because something is a chemical, by the way, doesn't make it bad either. There's a lot of misconceptions behind that and I try to address it, but just keep that in mind. Sometimes synthetic or lab grown materials are better than the natural option because the natural option is harvested using unethical practices, for example. But anyway, I found some other brands with a whole host of certifications and found that some were more expensive while one brand such as Verst was half. It can be incredibly difficult to buy sustainable products when the industry is so poorly regulated and expensive. So while I consider beauty counter pricey, I also haven't tried them like that. To get a better sense of their products, I looked up a few reviews to see what I could find, both good and bad. Here's what I found. One reviewer, Christian Cooper stated, if you're looking for clean makeup, skincare, sunscreen, and even men's skincare, Beauty Counter offers many products. They have everything from vitamin C serum to eye mask to lip gloss to shampoo and conditioner. They pledge to never use 1800 questionable or harmful chemicals in their products, including the 1400 chemicals banned in the EU's personal care products. The fact that the EU has banned these products does say that, hey, there may be a reason to move away from or rethink the ingredients we do use in beauty products currently. However, I also have a hard time taking Christian seriously because she herself is a beauty counter consultant. If the products really work for her and she genuinely loves them, then that's fine. But in good conscience, it's hard for me to consider this an unbiased or honest review. Ancestral Nutrition, who also joined them, was at least able to take more of an honest stance when they stated the following. Let's get this out of the way. Beauty Counter's products are not organic. They are not the cleanest or safest or most non-toxic on the market. This is a simple fact, but they are safer than the majority of products on the market and they're instituting a lot of change in the cosmetics game. Beauty Counter advocates for safer cosmetic laws. Quite literally, they lobby for safer skincare. And even though I still can't call ancestral nutrition unbiased, at least they aren't just ranting and raving about how wonderful Beauty Counter is because even they have had some complaints about the products. And I do appreciate that balance. Another reviewer, The Healthy Maven, says they were initially very skeptical of Beauty Counter. However, they believe the products are decent quality and the company, in their words, goes beyond offering more natural products to consumers. They're lobbying in Washington to get certain ingredients banned from our conventional skincare beauty products and are trying to increase regulation. Again, we'll get into the clean aspect more, but for now, let's focus on what the reviewers specifically state. The Healthy Maven also said under the con section that, They are not the most natural. Some consultants discuss this, others do not. Beauty Counter may be cleaner, but they are not chemical free. They use quite a few synthetics in their products, but ones that are shown to have little to no impact on the body. 
My biggest complaint is that I'll find a comparable product to one I already use and the ingredients are twice as long as the one in the BC product. I believe they use more synthetics to increase the shelf life, which I understand, but personally prefer these products that use fewer and less synthetic ingredients. This is a really personal preference thing, but worth noting for this beauty counter review. Based on my experience, only about one fourth to one third of the products compared or were better than other alternatives. There are just simply companies out there that are making better products and sometimes for much cheaper. Maybe it's because they're more focused on one or several products rather than a whole line of skincare and beyond, but I just wasn't overwhelmed by how amazing everything was. Funnily enough, Maven, whose name is actually Davida, also became a consultant after her experience, but she didn't last long. She said that one of the reasons she joined was simply to see what the process was like, and she does support their mission and some of their products. Her emphasis being on the sum. As for their reviews elsewhere, they only had one out of five stars on BBB and there's only seven reviews there in total to begin with. One review stated this, bought over $200 in product, didn't attempt to use until after 60 days, trying to use up older skincare products at home first. I used the rejuvenating face cleanser, the rejuvenating radiance serum, and the rejuvenating day cream and the rejuvenating eye cream two days in a row. Then I broke out in a red, dry, itchy rash all over my face and neck. I contacted Beauty Counter by phone to get a refund. They would not give me any compensation whatsoever for the over $200 spent due to it being outside of 60 days. The party host never mentioned this deadline at the time of purchase. I even told her I wasn't going to use it right away. So how would I have known this? Another source, Business Insider, had one of their writers call Beauty Counter the gold standard when it comes to clean beauty. Consumer affairs was incredibly mixed on their products, but reviews were overall negative. One person said they had mold growing on top of their lip conditioner after only two weeks. An incredibly telling review said this. I purchased this Beauty Counter shampoo for $25 for an 8.5 fluid ounce bottle and was notified by the company several weeks later that the product was being recalled due to contamination with Pseudomomas argrinosa. Sorry for butchering that. This is an antibiotic resistant bacteria that can cause disease in plants and animals, including humans. I had noticed my eye had become red and irritated about a week after using the shampoo and the following week, I had obvious infection in my bottom eyelid. After getting this email about the recall, I immediately informed the company of my condition and discarded the bottle, but not before culturing a small amount of the shampoo to confirm it was indeed contaminated. Note, I am a PhD scientist with a lab, thus I was able to confirm the presence of this gram negative bacteria in my shampoo, see image attached. I received no response from the company for four weeks. And if this is true, that is a horrible look. I can't verify the validity of these claims, but there is seriously a photo of a Petri dish attached to the review and it's, uh, it's gross. I don't know why anyone would go so far as to buy a Petri just just to make their negative review seem more legitimate. So I am somewhat inclined to believe that this person is not bullshitting us in this review. Another more recent review stated this. I'm a pharmacist. I consider myself knowledgeable about lotions, creams, ointments, and the chemical properties of a wide variety of cosmetic products and the potential health effects of using such products. I bought a few lotions at a party after being hounded by a neighbor sales rep that was downlined by yet another neighbor rep. I would consider the natural and clean products anything other than natural and clean, but full of nauseating headache inducing fragrances and actually lack their intended efficacy. The body lotions smell terrible and lack any lasting effect after applied. The sales rep suggested that it would last longer if I bought the body oil too. Ha, that means that the oil lasts longer. The lipsticks are drying. The sunscreens lack efficacy. And the funny thing about this natural clean beauty line is the abundance of packaging polluting the landfill. A third review I found laughably bad was when one verified reviewer said that they told their consultant how much they disliked Beauty Counter's products. The sunscreen didn't absorb, the tint rubbed off on everything it touched, the color of the tint was chalky, you kind of get the picture. This reviewer posts a screenshot where after telling her consultant this, they replied with a whatever shrugging emoji, like real fucking professional, right? Here's what her review explains. 
I suppose she did not like my answer, but I did expect a professional response. When questioned about her response, she stated, I truly don't know what to say. Clearly you've made up your mind, no point in me trying to change it. Had we had this conversation in person, I would have shrugged. There's no point in my sharing any additional info or trying to troubleshoot a product that you got so mad at you threw away instead of getting a free refund. Nice to know they have a return policy five days before the deadline for returns. If only their consultants were more professional, I would be willing to give them another try with other products, but the attitude I receive just isn't worth it. These distributors often talk about how they own their own business. And earlier we heard one say that it would replace a corporate position, but this is no way for a business to run, period. If a customer doesn't like a product for valid reasons, not just complaining for the sake of it, then you do what you have to do to make it right. Whether that's a refund, store credit, a new product, apologize profusely and move on. Shrugging hardly seems like what an actual business owner would do, or at least not one I'd like to interact with. However, despite all this bad press, another review site, Root and Revel, said they were safe, non-toxic, and had an A plus mission. So what's the truth? By this point, I've heard them called clean so many times that I really wanted to know what is the reality here? And is Beauty Counter, like, are they really as clean as they say, or do they have some dirty secrets they're hiding? But before we take a look at the reviews and what professionals are saying about Beauty Counter, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsor. This episode of Multi-Level Mondays is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Way, way back in the dark ages, then that's like 1970, a legend was born. That's right, Adam and Eve turns 50 years old this year. And to celebrate their 50th birthday, they've got something big in store for us. Adam and Eve is offering my listeners 50% off one item and free shipping in the US and Canada when you use code MLM at checkout. The best part, Adam and Eve doesn't just help you, you know, feel good, they actually do good too. 20% of their profit goes straight to fighting the spread of HIV all around the world. That paired with their 90 day no hassle return policy and their 24 seven customer service, you can't really go wrong. So don't wait until you're as old as Adam and Eve, head on over to adamandeve.com now and use code MLM at checkout to get 50% off one item and free shipping in the US and Canada. One more time for the folks in the back, go to adamandeve.com and use code MLM at checkout to get 50% off one item and free shipping in the US and Canada. This episode is also sponsored by Candid. Are you unhappy with your smile? Well, you don't have to be. Thousands of people have used Candid, the clear, comfortable, removable, and practically invisible aligners to help straighten your teeth. And now they love their smile. Just like Sharon H who said, I wore braces as a teenager. Flash forward 30 years, I had crowding on the bottom and one of my teeth actually stuck out. And that's when I made the decision to move forward with Candid. And I finally got my confidence back. And Candid is here to help you straighten your teeth so you can fall in love with your smile again too. Your treatment is prescribed and closely monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist who's an expert in teeth movement. You'll have the same quality of care you'd get from an in-office orthodontist from the comfort and convenience of your home without having to go out, which is something I hate at this point. And while other companies use general dentists, Candid only works with orthodontists. With Candid, the same orthodontist who created your plan is the one with you from start to finish, so you never have to wonder how you're doing. And the average Candid treatment is just six months and you'll start seeing results way before then. So start becoming your best you. Start straightening your teeth today. Right now, you can save $75 on Candid Starter Kit. Go to candidco.com slash MLM and use code MLM. Take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 on your starter kit. Candidco.com slash MLM, use code MLM. I found one of the most accurate reviews from the Derm Review. The Derm Review, a dermatology review, had both good and bad things to say about Beauty Counter, which is something I obviously appreciate. It shows that they're trying to remain unbiased. And here's what they had to say. All products in the Beauty Counter Countertime Collection include Bakuchiol, an East Asian plant extract that provides many of the same benefits as retinol, including the ability to diminish the appearance of wrinkles, and reduce the effects of sun damage, including uneven skin tone. One of the main benefits of this is that it provides retinol-like effects without irritation. Despite Lipid Defense being in the product's name, Countertime Lipid Defense Cleansing Oil will probably do more harm than good to your skin's lipid barrier, which consists of cholesterol, ceramides, and fatty acids. 
This is because there's so many fragrant plant oils used in this cleansing oil, such as lemon peel, orange peel, bergamot fruit oil, and sandalwood oil, just to name a few. These oils do not help improve the skin's lipid barrier. In fact, they are well known to cause skin irritation and damage due to their volatile fragrance components. Countertime Mineral Boost Hydrating Essence includes a biosaccharide gum one, a key ingredient. This is a polysaccharide that functions as a moisturizing and skin soothing ingredient. It binds water to the upper layers of skin, which helps give skin a soft, smooth feeling. Biosaccharide gum one also functions as an anti-irritant, which is good because there are plenty of irritating plant oils used in this essence, many of the same used in the cleansing oil. So if I'm to understand this correctly, basically Beauty Counter has anti-irritants in their product, which help combat the irritants that they put in their product and they name products lipid defense, even though the oils in them don't actually defend your lipid barrier. That's at least what I took away from that. And that makes zero sense to me. Obviously, I'm not a dermatologist. I've got no idea what any of these chemicals do on their own, but the fact that a dermatology review website can't call them clean, or at least not nearly as clean as they claim to be, speaks volumes about who Beauty Counter really is. And again, as I said, not every single one of their products has identical issues, but Derm Review does give them credit where credit is due. They say on their Countertime Tripeptide Radiance Serum, Beauty Counter actually uses ingredients that do help repair the skin's lipid barrier. One they mention in particular is known as squalene. Funny lipid defense doesn't seem to have this ingredient as of writing this, but okay. Beauty Counter's antioxidant soft cream also apparently doesn't have many antioxidants at all. And their Countertime Supreme Cream may be beneficial for those with lines and wrinkles, but its ingredients are risky for those with acne. Their eye cream has beneficial effects as well, but as for their sunscreen, this is what Derm Review had to say about it. The Beauty Counter sunscreen includes 19% zinc oxide as the active ingredient. Zinc oxide protects your skin by using physical UV filters to block or deflect UV light. The rest of the formula mostly consists of synthetic emollients. An emollient is simply a softener. Similar to the Beauty Counter sunscreen, the Dew Skin Tinted Moisturizer contains zinc oxide as the active ingredient to provide broad spectrum UV protection. The rest of the formula mostly consists of silicones and emollients. The majority of these emollients are synthetic. However, there are some natural emollients like beeswax or hydrogenated castor oil. There's a few others listed as well as alternatives to Beauty Counter on Derm Review. And if you wanna take a look, they will obviously be available in my sources. Overall, at least based on this source, I don't think that Beauty Counter uses provenly negative ingredients or extremely harmful ones, at least not to the extent we've seen from other MLM brands such as Unique or Rodin and Fields, yet they aren't as revolutionary as they try to be. There's also the matter of actually defining the word clean in the first place. Since there's no legal definition for a word clean in the business sense, the company itself defines these terms and regulations on its own. Make no mistake, this is one hell of a task, not just for Beauty Counter, but for anyone advocating for clean beauty. According to Forbes, consumers, particularly those experienced in the wellness category, will not tolerate a fake and they've got enough social media outlets to bring one down. So Beauty Counter, as well as Sephora, L'Oreal, and others are tasked with having to prove themselves. The best way to do that may be by helping consumers make better decisions rather than dictating what is right for them. A brand can do well selling small amounts of hard to find products to an expanding customer base. The tall order is maintaining exclusivity of product and authenticity in an industry that is flourishing. Contributing to the clean beauty credibility challenge is that it's not of a category of its own. It contributes to a growing 1.1 trillion global market for wellness-based beauty, personal care, and anti-aging goods and services, according to the Global Wellness Institute. Another key challenge of the clean beauty movement is the Food and Drug Administration is not empowered to regulate the beauty industry beyond color additives. It's up to individual companies to ensure their products are safe. As a result, clean beauty is heavily promoted by social media influencers and celebrities, not scientists, doctors, and government agencies. 
Beauty Counter seemingly helps with their cause with this never list. Rather than having to Google every single harmful product out there, consumers can know, hey, at least 1000 plus potentially harmful ingredients won't be in these products. Refinery29 also has an article out about how Beauty Counter has thrown their full support behind the Personal Care Product Safety Act that aims to promote transparency in the industry and give the FDA more authority in cosmetics. Beauty Counter has even become more transparent over the years themselves as well. One source called I Read Labels For You gave their own experience with this and stated the following. In 2015, Beauty Counter makeup and skincare company published a bold claim on their blog. The only way to be sure that your color cosmetics have undetectable or extremely low levels of heavy metals is to use Beauty Counter. Naturally, I requested their test reports, but they responded that I would have to sign a very restrictive non-disclosure agreement first. In other words, they wanted me to agree to not tell my readers about what I learned or even that I talked about that with them. That made no sense to me because my mission is to inform you so you can make informed decisions. So I kept corresponding with the company till March, 2017, but to no avail. I finally gave up. In 2021, they published their test reports on their website. Additionally, they removed the claim I mentioned before. Instead, now they say they do their best to keep heavy metals undetectable, but always within health protective company standards. Ultimately, I applaud them for becoming more transparent, but I still have some questions though. Why did they post test results for only 10 products and why these 10? However, it is a great start. Moreover, I completely understand that the difficulty of full disclosure for all products and their batches. So now I know that they test for heavy metals and the results are well below Canadian and European limits. The US has only guidance, not enforced limits for lead and mercury. The website continues to explain that there are more pros than cons for Beauty Counter. What concerns this writer is that they use synthetic colorants and that most plant extracts and oils are not organic. Phenoxyethanol, according to this source, is a middle of the road preservative that Beauty Counter uses. It's not the worst out there, but they could be doing even better. I read labels writer Irina also adds this. Beauty Counter uses some petroleum-based synthetic colorants, which can be contaminated with traces of heavy metals and petroleum contaminants. As compared to mineral pigments, some synthetic colorants have higher limits for lead, arsenic, and mercury. Last, I wish beauty counter makeup and skincare used more organic plant oils and extracts to reduce our exposure to pesticides and GMOs. However, as Irina stated, there are some positives here. Their packaging is supposedly sustainable, they use ethical mica, and they disclose their natural fragrance ingredients according to European law. Not to mention the whole third party testing part is accurate. And while they don't have a ton of tests available, there are some that you can view on their website. Their recent tests done in January, 2020 were done by MicroQuality Labs Inc. who, which at a first glance, doesn't have any affiliation with Beauty Counter, which is a good thing. Honestly, my biggest problem isn't necessarily Beauty Counter's ingredients. I do think that they're doing a fantastic thing by advocating for these law changes. I agree the regulation in cosmetics is abysmal and the laws are outdated. Even if their products may not be as quite deserving of the hype they get, I won't pretend that this isn't a step in the right direction. Beauty Counter's biggest problems, in my personal opinion, don't stem from their ingredients alone, but from the claims they make as an MLM and their shady behaviors in direct selling. Their frustrating consultants and income claims wouldn't be such a massive problem. Hell, these issues may not even have to exist if they weren't even using an MLM model to begin with. Though I I can't say for sure, I'm not sure I would trust Greg with a traditional business at this point either, especially given what we're about to get into next. We're going to start off these claims with one about the beauty industry that Beauty Counter has faced some backlash from. This isn't incredibly controversial or particularly awful, but it is a worrying sign. In essence, Lindsay Dahl, their vice president of social and environmental responsibility and Beauty Counter have put down the cosmetic industry in favor of making themselves look better. Rather than using black and white facts about the cosmetic industry though, they've exaggerated claims and made up things that are sort of worse than what they are. And it looks like they did it with the intention to make beauty counters seem like a safe haven in a dangerous world. 
The article that calls her out on this not only mentions Beauty Counter, but Goop as well. So you know there's going to be some eye roll worthy statements here if Goop is involved. Beauty Counter's website claims, over the past two decades, the European Union has banned close to 1400 chemicals in the product formulas of personal care products and restricted the levels of over 250 more in such products. The United States has only partially banned 30 to date. Take a few seconds and let that sink in. What would you assume reading that? I mean, that sounds pretty awful, right? Even when I heard that, I was pretty disappointed in the US and the US standards and the FDA are not very high. So I was kind of not shocked. I was like, wow, I was like, that's, that's pretty bad. If someone just randomly told me that, I probably would assume, wow, we really are falling behind. Like we dropped the ball and then some, but that's not entirely the case here. The EU has restricted or banned more ingredients from use in cosmetics than the US, but the comparison is misleading, says Linda Loritz, chief toxicologist at the Personal Care Products Council. The way their chemical regulation works, when things hit a certain list, they are banned in cosmetics. That doesn't mean they were ever used or ever considered or even appropriate for cosmetics, like industrial byproducts and jet fuel, Loritz says. That's why the number is so very, very high. Loritz says that while there are a few ingredients banned by the EU that have some limited use here in the US, most big cosmetic companies have international formulas so that they can be sold across markets and therefore do not have many differences. Now, technically beauty counter isn't wrong when they make these claims, technically, but using these numbers as a justification for their own products is a little bit lopsided to say the least. It really makes me question their other market tactics. Hell, I agree the cosmetic industry is under-regulated in the US, but the whole concept of a never list, if you're modeling it after the EU's list of changes of things in makeup anyway that aren't just gonna be there, like you're just like, hey, this thing's already not allowed and most formulas don't use it, but we're letting you know we're specifically not using it. And I admit as someone who's definitely in my undergrad taken many marketing classes because it fascinated me, this is excellent marketing. Like, let's just be clear. This is just amazing marketing that they could take something that is literally the standard anyway for international formulas and make it seem like they're different and special. It's actually incredible. But you also have to think that this should make you like raise a brow also, because this is just marketing to make you buy a product. That's the whole point of marketing. It's to make you purchase an item, a product or a service. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Interestingly enough, when they were confronted with this, Beauty Counter didn't really acknowledge their shady marketing. Here's what happened instead. Dahl acknowledges that ingredients on EU's list may not be regularly used in cosmetics. I don't think that diminishes or negates the fact that the EU and Canada pass stronger and more consumer friendly pieces of legislation than the United States, she said. And Dahl, darling, can I say it? That was a bad pun. I'm sorry. I like watched The Incredibles the other day, but anyway, darling, no one is arguing with you that the US needs better regulation. I'm just arguing that you shouldn't be using misleading numbers as a marketing gimmick. I know that Greg is ultimately responsible for this. She is the one that uses this as such a selling point articles. And that is a little bit worrying to me, frankly. It's not a downright illegal claim or a lie, but it's getting into some murky, suspicious gray area. That's all I'm saying. Maybe you agree with these tactics, maybe not, but let's start looking at some more definitive black and white truths, their income disclosure. And now the finale, the income claims that the distributors make. This is by far what Beauty Counter's biggest controversy is. After all, their founder says the whole reason she adopted this MLM model was to create job opportunities. So her employees should be getting paid extremely well, right? Also, as an aside, I don't know why MLM founders so frequently say they're creating more job opportunities. They know brick and mortar shops have employees too, right? Like MLM founders are just hiring thousands of more part-time pay nothing employees, as opposed to giving a smaller number of shop workers full-time work and a more stable job, but okay. Now, let me make it perfectly clear that it's not just distributors making these claims. That would be bad enough, but it's actually the founder, Greg herself. According to Truth and Advertising, Greg even took to targeting Spanish speaking women during the pandemic, which is pretty similar to how Herbalife likes to take advantage of immigrants looking for a better life in the US. Their article states, Renfrew, the founder and CEO, claims that the company's business opportunity is generous. Here's how she spins it to a group of Spanish speaking individuals. Quote, 
We help people make profit and earn much needed income or just additional income that makes their life a little easier. There's nothing to apologize about having to earn an income. We all need to make money and now, right now more than ever, people are hurting across the board and you all have an opportunity to serve your community by offering them, even in COVID-19, a business opportunity that affords people to replace much needed income in a time where so many people are losing their jobs and being furloughed, end quote. On another video conference call recorded on May 14th, Renfrew calls a group of bilingual women that this is the best moment to join Beauty Counter and encourages them to target college students who have lost their jobs before saying, quote, you are all perfectly capable of living in the United States of America where everything's in English and somehow you get through your days. Every single day, driving your cars, going to the grocery store, feeding your families, putting them through school. So it's the same with our business. Don't use that as an impediment to be successful with us. We are working hard to support you in Spanish. We do have a lot of things that are in Spanish today, but don't let that be an excuse. Let that be your opportunity to serve your community." End quote. The Beauty Counter CEO then tells these women that they have a responsibility to pitch the business opportunity to their communities to help families that need money to pay for the mortgage or school fees or need a significant income. And there are so many issues with this, it's almost hard to choose where to begin. First of all, the whole don't let a language barrier be an excuse mentality comes across as incredibly dismissive, rude, and generally nasty. Like Greg is trying to sell them on a job, trying to get them to sign up and that's her pitch. Secondly, she should not be making these claims unless every single one of the people she tells this to can actually manage to make a living wage. As many of you know, in an MLM, it simply doesn't work that way. You need a ton of people on the bottom in order to support the cash flow to the top. You know, like how a pyramid scheme does that kind of thing. Kind of weird how that works out every time. Anyway, that's just an odd uh, observation. Well, let's go ahead and see if this random quirky observation correlates with their income disclosure. According to Beauty Counter's own numbers, the average monthly earning of a consultant is $46. That's it. A senior consultant makes $336 a month, which is still not enough to feed a family or put a child through school as Greg has implied. Those two bottom titles make up over 90% of the company's distributors and the next two tiers, 2.8% and 1.7% respectively, still don't make more than $1,091 a month on average. Sure, the top earners might make almost $1,700, but that's still not much better than an almost full-time minimum wage job. The only ones making an actual living at this are the directors who in total make up about 3% of the whole company. Yet again, we see an MLM saying absolutely whatever they need to in order to lure people in when the reality of the situation is you'll probably gain nothing or even lose money by playing this game. There's just something especially scummy about this coming directly from the founder's mouth because she, of all people, knows what those real numbers are. Any respect they may have had for her for wanting to start an environmentally friendly business is completely shattered. And I mean, it's not to say it wasn't from the moment that I found out Beauty Counter was an MLM, but I still try to be hopeful that like, hey, maybe there's something semi-redeeming here, but nah, that one just kind of killed it. You, You scam your people. No, no mercy here. Truth in Advertising audited all these claims. If you want to see them, it'll obviously be in the sources. And seemingly because of their actions and reports, most of the examples have been taken down now. Some of these claims did read, my girlfriend was making in one month, how much it would take me three months to make working 40 hours a week. My driving force was join beauty counter was to literally make a thousand dollars a month. That was my big vision goal and dream when I joined. I hit director with the company. I matched my salary just by doing posts. Literally, I had zero experience, never done an online business before, never sold anything except a killer latte before, and I turned this business into a six-figure income. In three years of being with Beauty Counter, I have increased my income by 600%. So right before I did this, I used to work for the government. I had a really nice cushy job, great benefits, but recently I've been able to replace that income, which makes me feel so proud of myself. For me, Beauty Counter has given me financial freedom. It's given me the flexibility to be present at home all the time, to also be happily married and present for my husband. 
Frankly, whether these claims are true or not, it doesn't matter because ultimately they're being used as sales pitches when this is not the reality of the vast majority of people's experiences. The Direct Selling Self-Regulatory Council also came out with a statement last year that read the following. Beauty Counter noted its appreciation to the DSSRC's stated mission of monitoring marketing claims by direct selling companies and explained the company's commitment to conduct its business operations in compliance with applicable laws and regulations. As an initial point, Beauty Counter disputed the NGO's non-government organization in this case, it was Truth in Advertising, allegations that the company's income disclosure statements is inaccurate because it only reflected earnings data for active Beauty Counter consultants and that it excludes thousands of beauty counter consultants, presumably because they don't earn money. The company asserted that contrary to the NGO's mischaracterization of the company's income disclosure statement, the data shown in beauty counters IDS is for all beauty counter consultants, not just active consultants. The company called DSSRC's attention to language in the IDS, which states that, These figures include all consultants, even if they had no sales and therefore earned no commissions in a given month. The company stated that the NGO's presentation of this flawed position in an article on its website demonstrated that the NGO was disingenuous in its characterization of the truth and accuracy of the Beauty Counter's summary of consultant earnings. In other words, Beauty Counter is justifying this because many of their consultants, they claim, just aren't active. Then why not release another income disclosure without those inactive numbers to show, hey, most distributors earn a ton of money because unless they have that evidence to back it up, I'm just not buying it. Beauty Counter has begun opening brick and mortar shops up and they've even collaborated with Sephora, which is ultimately disappointing. They've truly developed an air of legitimacy and compared with many MLMs I've covered, their products do seem at the very least less harmful than what they could be. Not sure if that's much of a compliment, but you know, hey, at least we're not talking about Rodin and Fields or Monet or any of those types of MLMs, but all in all, I still can't recommend them. There's other clean brands that do it better. And when clean doesn't even have a legal definition to begin with, it hardly matters how much Beauty Counter shouts it to the rooftops. Their shady behavior as an MLM is naturally predatory. Their misleading statements are questionable and their CEO's attitude is infuriating. But hey, that is my opinion. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to like, follow, and subscribe to make sure that you are staying up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you want to chat with me or connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to go to the description box and click on my Linktree link. It'll have all sorts of available social medias like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff and other projects that I'm involved in. So again, thank you all so much for making it to another episode of Multi-Level Mondays. Love you guys and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.